Well, hello, everybody. You guys are super dedicated. I'm really impressed <laughs> that all you guys have made it out here on this has to be one of the, the latest sessions and wasn't even on the agenda until Tuesday, so really impressed that everybody made it out today. My name's Carl Meadows. I'm the Director of Product Management for OpenSearch. I um, oversee the open source project OpenSearch as well as Amazon OpenSearch Service and our Cloud Search product. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be talking to you guys today. We also have with us um, Pavani, who's, going to, who's the lead product manager for Open Search Serverless, she's going to be doing a demo. And Ryan's come, uh, it's a pleasure for him to come speak with us, uh, is the CTO from Risk Canvas in Genpack. So today, you know, we're going to talk about Open Search a little bit. I'll set it up and we're uh, introduce Open Search Serverless. And Pavani's going to come give us a demo and give you a sneak peek into the architecture. And uh, then we'll, we'll follow up, we'll finish up with uh, Ryan talking about Genpack and how they plan to use it. So who here uses open search? Yay, a lot of people. So I'll, I won't you know, talk a lot about it, you guys understand this, but like, you know, open search is a distributed search engine and it's useful for a lot of things. I mean, I like to call it a Swiss army knife just because I see Customers using it in all sorts of ways. Of, of course, it's used as a, for text search. I mean, it's a search engine. So we see it used in all sorts of you know, document search use cases. And then because of the distributed properties of it and its ability to handle high volumes of data, it's also really useful in, uh, for streaming data and doing real-time analytics with that streaming data. So you know, visualization, aggregations, this makes it great for log analytics, security analytics, clickstream data analysis. Um, so we see both. We, of course, offer Amazon Open Search Service, which is you know, a managed service for Open Search, which provides you with, traditionally, uh, dedicated clusters of Open Search. And we you know, take care of all the heavy lifting for you, making sure that it's secure, patched, up to date, providing you very simple APIs for scaling and uh, deploying clusters and keeping them patched. You know, we provide you know, observability tools as well as part of Amazon Open Search Service to provide you out of the box experiences for being able to do deep diving into logs and traces. Um, and you know, we hope by providing this service in the way we do provide it that it, it, it lowers your costs, allow you, allows you to focus more time on actually using the service and you know, get a great total cost of ownership. So let me talk just uh, briefly as well about open search itself. So open search is an open source community driven project that you know, AWS sponsors and you know, we, we launched Open Search September of last year and landed on the service. July of last year, we did 1.0 of Open Search. But it was driven by a change in the licensing for Elasticsearch, which we've historically and continue to offer older versions of Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is no longer Apache licensed, and you know, we use Elasticsearch a lot. A lot of our customers use Elasticsearch a lot. So we decided to fork and to invest in giving folks that relied on that Apache license a path forward. And so that's what Open Search is. So it was based off of 7.10 is when we forked. It is a distributed search engine that is powered by Apache Lucene as a search daemon. Um, Apache Lucene is very popular. It's a very... Um, robust and mature technology. It's what's used under the covers with Elasticsearch, with OpenSearch, with Apache Solar. Is all uh, Apache Lucene under the covers, and then OpenSearch is a distrib distribution system on top of that that layers on additional capabilities. Mm -hmm. OpenSearch also includes OpenSearch dashboards, which is the visualization tool used for you know, building dashboards, building uh, aggregations, being able to explore your logs. And this was forked off Kibana at the same time. OpenSearch also includes you know, all the clients, the tools, 
that uh, surround that ecosystem. And you know, we had prior to OpenSearch, we had been developing our own you know, plugins and extensions to Elasticsearch, which was called Open Distro for Elasticsearch. We folded all those capabilities into OpenSearch as well. So this includes things like anomaly detection, the security plugin, alerting, our SQL engine, um, all of those things were folded into OpenSearch. So a quick update, like how we're doing. It's, it's been great. I've been really, really excited to see that, you know, we thought people and customers and all sorts of people throughout the industry would find this useful, and they have. So, you know, we're now, I've seen over 100 million downloads of OpenSearch. It's Climbing the rakes and uh, DB engines is up to the number four in the search engines, so you know we'll keep pushing there. And we we have up over 40 partners at this point, and these are wide ranging. You know these are ISVs that are building experiences on top of Open Search. These are consulting partners that are <coughs> offering consulting and help to people deploying Open Search throughout the world, as well as other hosting providers that are offering Open Search on different clouds and on-prem. And so open search isn't just an AWS thing at this point. You know, of course, we offer a managed service and invest a lot in it and are very committed to it. But we've seen Oracle launched an open search service in Oracle Cloud. We've seen uh, Ivan and Instacluster and these other managed service providers that support multiple clouds offer open search offerings, um, as well as uh, Bonsai, who's a longtime hoster and friend of ours, um, now supports open search like on GCP. So we're really excited about it. It's, it's going great. So let, me, so let me set this up and I'm gonna talk a little about like what has open search managed service been? So it, we you know, support managed clusters and this has been a great deployment model for you know, a lot of our customers who are already managing and self-managing Elasticsearch and OpenSearch, excuse me, it allows you to, um, it's very flexible, it allows you to then lift and shift those types of deployments onto the managed service, because you can pick your instances, you can pick your storage, you can pretty easily model what you've been self-managing and drop it into the service, which has made it really popular. This allows you to really tune and customize your deployment to fit what your workload is. You know, if you've, if you've got, you need really low latency and you have lots of searches, you can you know, lean on you know, higher CPU instances or bigger RAM instances. Um, and, but you know, the, the challenges around it is it does require a lot of work of you. Like if you're gonna use the managed cluster, You've got to understand how your workload consumes compute. And you've got to think about, like, what, how much do I need to provision for peak? How much additional capacity do I need to provision in case there's a failure? Um, and you've got to then monitor that cluster. So if the access patterns change over time, you can make sure that it's properly resourced. So, you know, what we heard from customers is like, this is great. Love you guys, but can you make it easier? You know, can you, um, I don't really want to have to understand shards. I don't want to have to understand the, all of these resource consumptions. I really just want to use open search and I want to focus on, you know, driving my business. As well as, you know, we see some patterns where customers have really varying workloads. So that provisioning for peak usage can be really expensive. You know, I've got access patterns. Maybe I only index for a couple hours a night. Maybe I've got really seasonal, like daily patterns for how logs are coming in or how my users are actively searching. And having to provision the static cluster for peak can be expensive. You know, scaling clusters takes time because the storage and compute is very tightly coupled. So. Even if you do, when you scale, we provide you a really easy API and tools to actually scale those clusters, but it has to move around a lot of data. So you've got to kind of scale in advance of that usage coming because it can take, depending on how big the cluster is, 
how much data is on every node, it can take hours to actually scale a cluster. So it's not something that you can do very quickly. So with that, you know, we're really happy to announce that we're now in preview for Amazon Open Search Serverless. You know, that's, yay! Uh, no, um, <laughs> sweet, you guys are awake and it's Friday, that's awesome. Uh, no, no, um, so the focus of serverless was really to try to fix those problems, to make it really easy to administer, make it really fast and responsive, um, but at the same time, make sure that it like, fits seamlessly into that ecosystem. So the, the tools you're using, the clients, your application codes that are uh, interacting with open search, all just drop in. You know, you're not gonna have to do a bunch of work. Um, and then also to help, you know, keep bending that price curve to make this technology more and more affordable, more and more cost effective, because we are all creating more data all the time. And so we need to keep pushing on making sure that you know, open search can be as cheap as possible so we can use it for all the things we want to use it for. So I'll start, I'll introduce a couple concepts that are new with open search serverless. The first one is we don't have clusters anymore. So but you still need to have an organizing principle because you have an endpoint, your clients are writing to something, and uh, those are, in open search serverless, collections. So a collection is a group of indexes. It's got a dedicated endpoint for the API as well as the dashboards interface, and you can basically segregate your workloads by collection. Collections also have all their own policies around network access, data, uh, data access, security. When, and Pavani's gonna go through a demo, but you'll see when you set up a collection, we do also have them optimized for two different types of workloads. So you'll see that there's a time series collection and a search collection. And this is mainly so to make sure that we're optimizing it properly for the workloads. So time series workloads, you'll see, you'll often have an access pattern where you have hot data that you're accessing very frequently, and as the data ages, it gets accessed less frequently. And so with the time series, we want to make heavy use of a warm tier so that you can save money using it. Whereas search, it tends to be, you always want that data in hot. You always want a very consistent and fast, low latency for your queries. And so we use that bucket to make sure that we're you know, provisioning and managing them accordingly. And then the other new item with uh, serverless is basically how it's billed. So it's billed via OCUs, which are open search compute units. So you don't have to provision OCUs, you don't have to really know anything about OCUs, but that's the compute that's being consumed by your workload and the increments that you're gonna be billed with. And so each OCU is a certain amount of RAM, six gigs, a certain amount of ephemeral storage to include the hot storage and uh, compute, and they scale up and down dynamically. The, and in preview, with each account, we start with a minimum of four OCUs for now, which is redundant OCUs for indexing and redundant OCUs for search. Now, the good thing about these OCUs is that they can be shared across collections. So if you've got multiple collections and they're not like heavily used, like say they're you know, dev or staging, then you, those four OCUs could support you know, seven, eight collections. Um, so the, uh, you know, as we go forward, we'll look at you know, additional options for how we can continue to bring that down, but that's basically how it works, and then the OCUs will scale up and down as needed. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the architecture, then I'm gonna let um, Pavani do, go in a little deeper, but so how, this is actually a quite different architecture than the traditional open search, which is cluster, and the compute and storage are very tightly coupled, indexing and search are tightly coupled, but to build a real cloud native service that we could offer to you guys to scale, we had to break these elements apart and do a different architecture here. And so with serverless, under the covers, we've actually broken indexing and search apart. So you've got, sep there, you don't see it, you have one endpoint, but the API gateway will send a separate path to do indexing, so your compute can scale up and down on indexing, 
and a separate path for search. And the benefit there is, you know, when you get a big rush of logs, like your search won't be impacted. Or if you get a big spike in search, your indexing pipe load will, will continue to work because they're separated and they can scale independently. There's actually, underneath the covers, there's coordinators across those collections that then route to the various OCUs, which are the red, like basically worker nodes underneath the covers, which are what you build by. So those OCUs are redundant. And then, like, indexing is writing directly to S3. So you get the benefits of the durability of S3 as well. And then your, your searchers, they have ephemeral storage, but they're constantly pulling data from S3 directly to hide S3 from you. You don't have to worry about the fact that, you know, it's slower storage underneath the covers. That's all being, you know, pulled directly into the workers which are responding to your requests. And we make use of integrated you know, hot warm, so in the time series cases. So this allows um, us to use fewer workers to query more data, so it helps you keep the cost down. Integrated into open search serverless is a, uh, basically security sidecars that are analyzing, you know, access auth, auth in and auth z uh, across all of those workers, ensuring and managing the encryption. And we also provide open search dashboards, complementary. It's not, you know, you don't have to do anything. Open search dashboards is provisioned for every collection. So you get an endpoint for open search dashboards, which you can log in and do your visualization with. We've also changed how we're doing security with serverless to make it more easier to integrate and easier to automate. And you know, if, you, if you're aware of like how open search clusters work, every domain has its own security. You're configuring security in the engine. With serverless, we've extracted security, so it's policy-based, and um, it has you know, all the things you would expect from an AWS service, encryption in flight, encryption at rest, being able to manage your own keys, that's all available by default. But you can set up a policy where as an administrator, I can say, okay, this team can access any collection with these, you know, in this string um, with write and read access, use these keys, use this VPC for any collection that, you know, matches this naming pattern. And you can set those policies up ahead of time. And then that makes setting up collections really easy. So it's gonna, it can inherit all the policies you've already configured and be secured by the policies you configured, as well as, you know, you could provide more detailed policies for each collection if you want. But it should make um, this much easier to automate and, to, and control. And this includes role-based access. Um, you know, we also have support for VPC access through private link, as well as public access. But one of the other nice features of serverless is that you can control like, one thing we, we heard a lot is, like, man, I wish dashboards could be in public, but I don't want the open search API to be public. You can set up different policies for both endpoints. Um, so you can say, hey, I can put dashboards out. It's protected by SAML, but I want the API only available directly to the VPCs for the machines that are indexing data into it. And we support SAML auth right now in preview, and, you know, we'll add more options as we go forward. So with that, I, I'll stop talking, and uh, I'll let Pavani come up and show you guys it's real. And uh, you know, thanks so much. I'll be back. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I'm just going to log into my laptop to get started. So we start off with creating collections, right? So you can get started with creating collections, really you know, quick way of creating a collection. Collection is nothing but a group of indices, right? There's no more domains. It takes, the first collection takes about five minutes to create, and any collection after that would take about under a minute, right? And again, collections, you know, you could have collections for your dev team, collections for your prod team, and you can have multiple collections in an account. So let's get started with creating a collection. 
right? So we go with the collection name. <laughs> okay, and then as Carl mentioned, we have options for time series and search. So behind the scenes, you know, we also have different sharding mechanisms for time series and search, and that's one of the reasons that we really wanted to segregate, and we'll talk about that more in the subsequent slides. So once you picked, a, you know, a type of collection, you really can't change, right? In the future, we will plan to mix and match collections, but for now, you know, you go with either time series or search. So time series is for your log analytics use cases, you know, clickstream analytics, and then of course search is for enterprise search, catalog search, and, and so on, or content search. Next, we are looking at encryption. So here again, you can actually pick, you know, go with AWS own key, or you could go with, uh, you know, customer managed keys. So we have a lot of customers that basically, you know, provide service to their customers, and, and they came back to us and said that, you know, typically their customers require them to use their keys, right? So you could do that now. You could have a collection per tenant or per customer, and you leverage the keys that they're providing over here. You grant them access. So for this demo, let's go with the AWS own keys. Next thing is network access settings, right? So now again, we can go with public or we could go with VPC. So for this, you know, this particular demo, we'll go with public. Network access is something you can change even after you've created a collection, right? The only two things that you can change once after you've created a collection is your encryption key and the collection type for now. And we create a collection. So while the collection is getting created, I also wanted to talk about the other option we have, which really works well, you know, for multiple collections, right? When you have multiple collections, you basically create, you know, the encryption key, the network policies, and the data access uh, mechanisms for your customers, so that when the customers come in and they want to use open search, all they have to do is provide the collection name, type, and the encryption key, right? They don't have to worry about the security policies because you've already configured it for them, right? For example, if you, you know, if it's a marketing team, you can create collections, and the collections don't have to be present, right? You don't have to create, already create those collections. You just give a prefix that's collection star, oh, sorry, marketing star. And, and you set policies for, for those uh, customers. So let's go back and see how we're doing with the collections. It's still creating. Okay. So what I'll do is, while the collection is getting created, we've created the network policy, we've created the encryption keys, but there's one more thing we need to have before the collections are accessible and that is your data access policy. Data access policy is talking about authentication and authorization. Who is authenticated to use this collection and what are the permissions they have to be able to use it? So you can see that once the collection is created over here, you could see it takes you saying that, you know, it takes you to the data access policy, which is, you're, you know, you're not really, you really can't access your collections until you've created an access policy. So let's just do. Now here, we've come up with uh, you know, the new uh, policy model over here. You can create multiple rules for your collections, right? So policy comprises of multiple rules. So let's just go with rule. A lot principles. Again, you can add, you know, this is the authentication piece. I'll just go with, that's a demo. I just want to be careful. Actually, it's just one, but. And now you grant the permissions, right? We have the collection level permissions, which is for alias and templates. And then you have the index level permissions, right? 
So for today, we'll just give them all the permissions. And so you could have a second rule which says that you know, user X can only you know, read the documents. And then maybe the third user, John, could only write you know, to this collection. You could have various rules under that one access policy. And let's go ahead and create the collection. Okay. Okay. Great. So we are all set. And that's pretty much it. Now you can start pumping traffic into this collection. So as you can see, you really don't have to select any instance type. You don't have to worry about the shard sizing. And you don't have to worry about the index management anymore. Right? So we already have a workshop uh, you know, for those that are interested. Uh, that's getting started with uh, Amazon Open Search Serverless. So what I'm going to do is, in this workshop, you know, we pick the time series, and go to basically ingest data using a Python data generator. So this is the code. I know it's not very clear, but I'll just go about quickly. The changes I'm making to this code is essentially just the host name and the region, right? We're using the same client that you've already been used to or you're familiar with, you know, with the, when using managed service. The things that we need to change is just the host name, the region, and the service, which is AOSS in this case. And then we have the two endpoints over here, which is you know, your um, API endpoint and the dashboards. And while we are generating the data, what we could do now is go to the dashboards URL. <coughs> oh, there was one? OK. Yeah, thank you. Uh, OK. Good? Yeah. So here what I'm doing is now I'm, I already have a template, so I'm just going to download that template. Over here. So essentially, the data we're generating is a fleet management data, right? It's basically giving you the fleet, you know, uh, the fleet ID, uh, the, the destinations, and then, of course, uh, weather conditions. Okay.
Okay. As usual, looks like something's not working, but anyway, I promise it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Demo cards. So with that said, now I'm going to go into the details of how we're doing that behind the scenes, right? So the very first thing is indexing. As we mentioned, we're breaking down the functions over here between indexing and search, right? So once the data comes to the gateway, you know, the gateway is basically ensuring that you're authenticated before it allows the traffic into the indexing compute nodes, right? Once the, you know, once the user's authenticated, now the data goes to the coordinator that basically would then pass it to the respective collection. The coordinating, uh, coordinators are holding the metadata information for where to route the, uh, you know, route the indexing data, right? Once it goes to the collection, a collection again is backed by the OCUs. Uh, the OCUs are the indexing nodes over here. What they're doing is basically converting, they're indexing the data, converting them into Lucene segment files, and those segment files are then getting flushed onto S3, right? As you notice, there's no node-to-node -node communication over here. All the data is being now moved to S3. So S3 is holding your segment files. As the workers over here, or the OCUs, uh, or the workers as we call, are pushing that data, they're also updating the metadata with the location information and uh, in, in, in DynamoDB, right? So what happens next is the search is pulling and looking for any new data or new, you know, new shards, new updates in the shards, and then it reads, the very first step is it reads from S3. So it's continuously getting updated as we are adding the data in here. So now next, when you make a query request, it goes to the gateway, again, it goes to the coordinator, and then, you know, basically the replicas over here are responding to your queries. By default, we have two replicas running all the time in different AZs, right? So for log analytics use cases, we also have built-in hot warm, um, you know, um, hot warm arch uh, architecture. So what, what that means is, you know, you have your data that's getting cached in hot, which is the OCUs, and as, as the data ages, we're basically storing that in the warm architecture. The warm OCUs are essentially holding the metadata information for the shards. So if a query, you know, this typically in log analytics, customers want to use the most recent data. And then if a query happens to, you know, if you happen to query a data that's probably older than, than a day or a couple days, then you basically, uh, you know, the, uh, the query, the coordinator sends that query to the, uh, the blue OCUs over there, and the blue OCUs are pulling the data from S3, pulling the relevant shards from S3. The big advantage here is that with the OCUs, you can pack much more data, right? And that's, that's essentially, uh, you know, the benefit of using hot warm architecture. Next is the auto-scaling. So how does auto-scaling work? You know, again, we are continuously looking with every OCU, we have a sidecar agent that's basically pushing the metrics to an observability service. That's one of the microservices in the control plane, right? And that service is evaluating, you know, the, the threshold breaches. And then what happens is once we see that there's a breach, say in disk size or CPU, it'll basically connect with another service, which is the elasticity manager, and we end up adding more OCUs. These OCUs now, again, are reading from S3. The benefit of this architecture is durability. I mean, I've, I'm, there are many more benefits, but you know, what you get is the durability, right? Because it's, we are using, we, pr we get the durability of S3, in essence, which is the 11 nines. Similarly, for uh, search order scaling, if you see there's a sudden spike in search requests, we add more replicas. And again, these replicas are read from S3. 
All right. With that said, you know, we would like to invite Ryan. Ryan's from GenPact. He's been really helpful. He's tested out our private beta, and he's here to talk about his experience. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pavani. And how about a live demo? Come on, how hard is that? Uh, you have to sacrifice to the demo gods, otherwise it just, you know, sometimes doesn't work out. So I'm Ryan Skousen. I'm a VP of technology at GenPact. I also play the role of CTO for our product, Risk Canvas. It's an anti-money laundering uh, product suite that we offer as a SaaS offering on AWS, and we use open search pretty heavily. Um, so raise the hands. When I said anti-money laundering, who thought about fraud and stolen credit cards? Anybody? Yeah, a few, right? Uh, there are two big problems in financial crimes. There are actually quite a few, but the two big ones are fraud and anti-money laundering. Uh, up at the top, AML does not mean AIML. Um, and, and in fact, it goes deeper than just the acronym. Um, uh, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. There are two different problems, and they have very mm -hmm. different solutions, actually. So in fraud, one of the big things that you need to understand is uh, everyone knows when fraud's happening, uh, the bank is losing money. I mean, every That's second stunning. that there's a fraud case going on, the bank loses money. Because of that, they're highly motivated to stop it. Um, they, they are constantly trying to build new ways of doing that, and that obviously means that they turn towards machine learning and AI. Um, the other thing is they have great feedback loops. If you think about it, right, the vendors that, or the merchants who are also in the loop, you, every time that your credit card is stolen, is, you know, you're calling them and telling them there's an issue, these aren't charges I recognize. They're able to train models and build machine learning, so they're building the best mousetrap. Now, in AML, it's actually very different. You think about, like, you know, you've got a, a narco who's just done a big deal, and he brings a load of cash, and he wants to put that into the legitimate system, right? He wants to buy cars and stuff. Um, he gives to the bank and wants to put in all this money. What does that look like to the bank? That's business, right? That's, like, more cash. Yeah, that's money. That's going through the bank. Um, so they, there is an, a motivation structure dichotomy here. That's a, that's a big issue. Um, and, and that really plays through the rest of the bullets that I want to talk through here. Um, the regulators, the bank, or the, the government is the one who's going to find the bank if they aren't doing their due diligence to find these bad actors, these criminals. And so the bank's really worried about satisfying the government. They're really worried about compliance. They're not worried about finding everyone. And don't get me wrong, there are good people. I mean, really good people. They wouldn't be in this business if they didn't care. Um, so these compliance teams do care deeply, but there's not a natural motivation structure built into it. I'm, I'm setting all of this up because I think a lot of times people do go immediately to mach machine learning and AI to try to solve you know, financial crimes problems. And, and it'll play a lot into our specific issues and, and technical challenges and how we approach them. Um, so I just wanted to kind of talk through this a little bit. So regulators, they're the ones in charge. They make the rules. In fact, they even delegate and, and tell people exactly how to do the investigations that the banks need to do. And so while you can do machine learning, you know, there's a lot of uh, clustering approaches you can do. You can do peer group behavior analysis. You can figure out whether your customers behave like their other customers without a, a feedback loop. You can do a lot of um, unsupervised things there. And we, we've done some interesting things with some of our partners. But really, that's on and beyond the mark. That's not what the regulators want. They say, do the investigation this way, monitor alerts, you know, transactions this way, and then show me that you've done that. Um, a little bit about where we came from, because I think it also helps with context. Um, you know, acquired by GenPact in 2019, we've been building Risk Canvas even prior to that for uh, about five years. We actually came prior to that. We came from the US government. We were in the Department of Defense and Intelligence space. We were big, building big data analytic architectures. In fact, we built the first one um, on one of the defense networks. Uh, that did big data analytics at scale. We had thousands of disparate data feeds going into this one um, big data system. Um, we were doing millions and millions of documents coming through. They were all unstructured. So we were doing natural language processing, natural language understanding, extracting features from that, making those sub-second searchable. We were using Lucene then, too. Um, 
And then we were exploiting all of those features to build what? A human or organization, an entity-focused view of intelligence analysis for the US government. And it is still used. That system is still used today. Tens of thousands of government analysts are using that on a regular basis to really defend our nation and defend our nation's partners. And that's our heritage. That's where we came from. And that entity-centric view was critical to us. Uh, without going through the details of how we came to the commercial space, when we got here, we saw, in fact, they were doing the same thing. It was really interesting. They were already doing an entity-based investigation approach. Um, but that approach, unfortunately, had some, some issues with it. So generally speaking, this is how an investigation goes. You know, that mule, that, that narco comes in and tries to slip his money in in like smaller increments, uh, has a bunch of activity deposits or other, other financial activity that's going on in the bank. That is monitored by a machine. So a machine is monitoring that, producing alerts. You're talking a 97% false positive rate there. Huge issue as far as like how that's done. Why is it such a high false positive rate? Remember who, who told us what rules we should run? The government, the regulators. And the, they're very rules based, they're very deterministic like rule models. Um, but then those alerts go and become an investigation. You have to pull in a lot of information to understand what the risk is of one of those uh, individuals or organizations. And remember it could be either. Um, so you have to look at their attributes. Are they on a watch list? Is there negative news out there? Um, all of their transaction activity and, and potentially other investigations that have happened. You have to collate a bunch of data together. And that's where my, our problem starts to come in. Today, humans do that. In most institutions with most products out there, humans do that. And so you've got a 97% false positive rate that's triggering a human review and then you're spending hours and hours going through this and then finally presenting a, a report to the government. Oh, and the feedback loop on, on two slides back that we mentioned, does the government tell the bank who was actually persecuted or prosecuted? Does it, no, like law enforcement doesn't tell the bank. So there's no feedback loop. There's no feedback loop to know if you're right or wrong. Um, so that's a big issue. And when we came into it coming from the government where we did NLU and automated every aspect of um, that, uh, that pipeline of data, we said, hey, look, we can't do everything. You know, regulator says, I have to have a human look at that, but we can do something. And so what we did is come in and say, we can automate 90% of that human process and, lead, and, and even all the way up to building a risk model that's consistent based on specific defined thresholds and then give that both data, context, and the risk, kind of the high level risk profile to an analyst and save them hours. So that's what we did. Um, it looks like this in Risk Canvas. I'm not trying to sell you Risk Canvas, but just to give you context of what it looks like, we have, you know, uh, uh, this is all fake data, I promise. Um, but we have, you know, a customer and their attributes. We have a huge risk profile that goes across the top. It considers all of those things, gathers all of that data together, all of their activity, all of their attributes, all of the things that we can possibly know about them. Um, that's a pretty hard technical problem to do. Um, it's, not an anal it's not deeply analytically challenging, but it is difficult from the volume of data, how heterogeneous all of that data is. Uh, Risk Canvas is built natively on NoSQL architectures because we couldn't do it in a relational system. Um, and, and so you see millions of you know, customer attributes data come in. We have to do millions by millions of checks against negative news. So those customers against tons of negative news hits. We have to do sanctions hits and that comes in streaming for every transaction that comes into the bank. It also comes in on a regular customer sanctions check. Um, and for each of these things, I won't go through all of them, you can read, uh, but we have an engine, we have different engines that are doing this, heavy ingest engines, streaming, uh, serverless engines, we have EMR Spark analytic engines, and all of that to kind of do this entity-centric monitoring that we've, we've brought to the market. Um, incredibly challenging, and it also means there are, two, there are some big bottlenecks for us, and these were our open search bottlenecks. We had to make all of that data exploitable, analyzable, um, queryable, retrievable, and all of that meant, you know, we, we heavy, heavily use open search for all of those capabilities, and that made a huge choke point. Jumping one step down into our, you know, pseudo-architecture, um, the, 
the real issue was that you see on the left and on the right, I've got huge heavy data ingest and, and data loading happening. I've got huge analytic processing, including heavy queries, plus like scrolling and large scale data uh, extraction out of my architecture. And that happens, I mean, besides the streaming one, which does go throughout the day, but most of that happens when? At night. Happens for like a few hours every night. And then what's happening during the day? Exactly what Carl was talking about. I've got like disparate data access patterns coming at it, and I've got like 50 to 100 compliance team members who are looking that, at that, and it's just a trickle. But what did I have to do? I did have to build a large scale cluster, handle all of that nightly activity, and let it just sit and putter during the day. And that's hugely costly for me. So this is how we envision using OpenSearch serverless to solve our problems. I, I kind of talked about customer, account, transaction data. That's like 99% of the data that's going into my system. So what I plan to do is actually bifurcate my data sets, put all of that real heavy data that, by the way, won't change until tomorrow, and I put that and ingest it, analyze it, process it in serverless. It'll only charge me what I'm actually using, and it'll scale dynamically and automatically to what I need. And then I'll put the rest of my transactional data, the investigations, the rest of the, my app data all into a managed service cluster that I can keep small and is highly transactional, highly responsive. Um, and then I have a very balanced data access pattern for both my users, my large scale analytics. And we expect we'll save in the neighborhood of 60 to 80% on our open search bill just from the standpoint of not having to have those large scale systems running 24 by seven. Um, so we're really excited. We're, we're really excited about the concept. Um, I'll talk just for the next two slides and, and try to cut it pretty quick about just my experience of testing it. What you just saw Pavani do in, in, in real time, you guys all saw it, is, is true. I mean, when I went in to test this, I've been doing beta testing for the last couple of we weeks. Um, Setting up a new collection, making it work, getting uh, that thing set up and tested and some data pushed in and out, so easy. Like within minutes, my, my security config estimate was actually more just me learning this different security config model. Um, and then client code, what does it actually take? I just used the existing high level uh, REST client, the Java one. Um, and I added like 20 lines of code to basically shove in the, the AWS SIGV4 token header. Um, but it was super easy. I, I was able to do that with the documentation provided and get it working within less than a day. Um, update the config files, point it to the new thing just like you saw her do, and it was working. And that was an existing, it was a glue-based, pretty he heavy data ingest job that that's really all I had to do to integrate now into a collection and I was immediately able to start pushing data in. It was like a bit magical. Now, there was trial and error, right? It was beta, give them a break, mm -hmm. you know? They're, all of us have been there, mm -hmm. um, but it, it really was uh, pretty easy to get going. And then lastly, a little bit of my experience. What did I test? By no means, you know, my, my pattern is probably very different than yours, um, but bulk pushing, I was able to do that kind of seamlessly without any effort. The typical things you would expect, you know, catting the indices, understanding those, searching obviously on an index and, and putting and getting docs all there. I was actually pretty impressed. Like the mapping, we have pretty, you know, it, it's a wide record that we have, hundreds of columns, nested, uh, nested objects, um, some that were enabled, some that were disabled. We have a lot of different text and hidden text, keyword fields and things like that. All worked. Didn't require any sort of like finagling to get that going. What didn't work? The first one, awesome, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the cluster anymore. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And so you don't have underscore cluster. You don't think about it that way. That actually simplifies everything. Um, refresh, also kind of cool. Like you, you don't need to think about it that way. I will say as you go into it, think about those data access patterns, right? Like our data access patterns, I clearly have a transactional case still. It makes sense to use that maybe in a slightly different place. You are indexing and then refreshing out through the search side. So you have to think through that a little bit. Um, but like refresh, I don't really think about that because of the data access patterns that I'm using. 
Um, stored scripts, this actually was an issue for us, and I, I know the team is working insanely fast. I mean, they are turning stuff around weekly and getting things going. I do expect this one to come relatively soon, but that's one we use really heavily. We use like stored scripts compiled down into our, our queries, and we do a lot of kind of inline analytics there. So that's one that's not yet there, and scroll is one that they're also working a lot on um, that we use heavily. And then auto scaling, my particular workload we were just talking earlier today with Bhavani. Um, it seems like it actually was like seeing and detecting the scale, uh, the scaling needs that I had, but the way my workload tends to, to hit it doesn't, doesn't really trigger the, the auto scaling. So I know they're working on the balance of that and what kind of workloads make sense and don't make sense and when they should auto scale. Um, but I will say one thing, like it ended up being like, what did we calculate? It was like 40% of the cost to run this on open search, my, my loads on open search over the course of like a month than what I run today and what I need today. So it's, it's really interesting. So with that, I'll, I'll just say, you know, um, no joke on the architecture stuff. I've been able to see a little bit behind the scenes and the rethinking of how that is and the rethinking of how shards are managed and the complexity of that is, is really awesome. It's really exciting. And um, we are super excited to, to be doing that. So thank you for listening to me. Happy searching, everybody. Mm -hmm. I'll hand it back over. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. No, I just want Guys, um, folks, live demo does work. Yeah, that was a user error, so I had to come back. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So the mistake I had done is, and I'm in my excitement to show you the, uh, the live demo, working live demo, I didn't set up the security permissions correctly. Right? I set up the index permissions, but I really didn't select. The part I didn't do was, let me go down. Yeah, so when, when I was granting, I, I did this part, but I never ended up going to selecting the indices. So the index didn't have read-write permissions. Mm -hmm. So security works. <laughs> <laughs> And the demo works. Uh, so this is what we've been, and I'm not faking, it's last five minutes. The generator is still running. Thanks, thanks for pointing that error. And um, voila, we have the, the visualizations are working. OK? So with that said, I think I'll pass it on to Carl. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you both. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up and talk a little bit about how it's priced and so where we are in the development process. So this may seem fairly obvious at this point, so I won't belabor it. But uh, when you think about managed clusters, you've got to basically configure your workload, configure your instances, provision for peak, provision for failure, add ultra warm nodes if you're using ultra warm for a hot warm architecture. And all that leads to a pretty static price that regardless of what you know, your workload's doing under it, because like we talked about earlier, the scaling takes time. So you can't scale like just in time typically um, with a traditional open search cluster. With serverless, there's a highly accurate graph I drew in PowerPoint. <laughs> and, um, you, your OCUs for both indexing and search are going to dynamically move up and down, and then you're going to be billed for the storage that you're consuming at a near S3 price. So, um, uh, so you know, at the end of the day, you know, what we hope to see is that you know the majority of customers in the fullness of time should hopefully be able to save money with this architecture. So. Um, you know, it you know, may scale up above, but it's also going to be scaling down below. And in and, and the end goal here, what we really want is to provide more value to you guys. And hopefully this saves you money. So, you know, where are we now? Um, we're in preview. It's ungated preview. You can test it out now. You can go start setting up collections. I think the things we're really going to be working on in the preview, like, you know, Ryan mentioned, is like we really want to make sure auto scaling is nailed and that the core platform is really responsive and working well. Um, and you know, we'll be working over that you know, the next few months. We're not planning a really long preview, but we really want to make sure as we get more and more workloads on there 
that the scaling's working well, that you know, different types of access patterns and queries are, are acting well and the performance is good, and that we can, you know, the architecture is gonna allow us to really scale to support large collections and large accounts and large data, and so we wanna start testing that scale and incrementally go from there. And then post, uh, you'll, you know, as we move forward, right now it's pretty vanilla. Like, so the features we have are like core search features, core dashboard features. A lot of the more advanced open search features that we've developed over the years, like vector search and alerting and anomaly detection and observability features, we'll be rolling those in. So we just, like I said, we really want to make sure the platform is great and then we can add these more advanced features as we go. Um, we'll probably also be looking to add um, like manual pause resume as well. That's something I've heard a lot this week. Um, but yeah, it's, it's coming along great. You can start testing it now. The, um, uh, you know, the goal is for it to feel like open search, right? So it should be fast, it should be responsive. You shouldn't have to worry about shards anymore or cluster sizes. Um, and you should only pay for what you use. A couple other points I want to say is that it is a deployment option for Amazon Open Search Service. So all of the compliance programs that you enjoy today, like FedRAMP, like HIPAA, those things, serverless inherits those as well. So this is just an option inside the service you can take advantage of if you've got, uh, if you take advantage of those programs, you can continue to with the serverless. And, um, you know, we've really designed it under the covers to be highly available and durable, so you don't have to worry about those things. The monitoring you'll see in it, uh, you know, so there's built-in CloudWatch metrics, you know, like there would be with any service, but they're more focused on the KPIs. So they're gonna be focused on what your latencies are, the docs coming in, the number of queries you have, errors. It's not gonna, you don't have to worry about, you know, CPU load, garbage collection stats, my young generation, like no, you don't have to worry about any of that. That's now our problem. So um, yeah, with that, you know, you know, we are gonna continue to have two options here and I, I think both of them are gonna be highly valuable to customers. I think Ryan's use case was great and that he still plans to keep a managed cluster too. So we'll continue to focus in the managed clusters, making it more tunable, more flexible, um, more transparent when you have those use cases that you need that control. While we continue to, to support serverless, uh, something that's easier, more you know, scalable, where um, you know, I think the majority of workloads will probably start enjoying serverless as it matures. But you know, there's gonna be cases where you might want both. Like we see a really large range of use cases. And um, you know, from all types of search, you know, like ad tech customers that have like very simple searches, but they have to be super fast to, you know, like a geospatial use case where they've got these really big searches that, you know, maybe they don't need to be as quick. And so I think it's gonna take time for serverless to support all of those use cases like flawlessly. Um, and so I, I imagine that, you know, we'll continue to see a lot of people using managed clusters. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, now you at least have two options. <laughs> and we're gonna keep iterating and building from there. So uh, with that, I mean, I really appreciate both of you, and you know, I, I'm, <laughs> we're really happy you got to share the demo. Uh, um, and you know, thank you guys so much for coming out on you know, a Friday. Hope you have a safe trip home. Uh, is this the last session? Do you guys have more sessions? You got more? Sweet, you guys are troopers. You're like in this. <laughs> and, um, so I really appreciate everybody, and you, know, you can come chat with us. And, you know, have a good show. Yeah.